2 Corinthians 12, the purpose of Paul's thorns and uh, the purpose of our enemies against whom we fight. We mentioned um, last Sunday morning concerning Judges chapter 3 and the purpose for God leaving um, some of the Canaanites and the Hivites in the land of Israel. The reason why God left them in there was to teach every generation of Israelite how to know and to do war, how to fight battles. And they were there to prove, um, to, to prove the Israelites to see whether they would believe and trust in God or not. Um, for those who say that when you get saved, God gives you the easy way, uh, that's not true. Um, I see heaven as being at the other end of a very long, fast-moving stream, and it's, up, it's upstream the whole time. Um, now, get, now, once we're in heaven, it's, that's, easy. that's the easy part, is being in heaven. But getting there, and for God to use the thorns... As, the, as sort of the proving ground of who really is and who really isn't. Um, we know that in the 21st century, I'm going to say churchianity in America, we know we have a very, very serious sin problem. It's huge. That, and I can't even use the words to describe how bad it is, how deep it is. But because people go to a church, they think everything's okay. And, if, and you know, I was thinking about this yesterday and today, just the number of churches that are in Jefferson County, I think it's probably grown even since I was a, a, a boy. In fact, I know they have. And some of these churches are running pretty good numbers. But I know some of them. And I know the things that they never speak out against. The things that they never say. The things that they'll never teach or preach on. And it's almost like, you know, if you go to, if you go to such and such church or go to church in period or in general, then you're going to go to heaven. And uh, I don't think that's the case. I think we always have Israel as our guide to see the state of affairs that we're in right now. And God clearly left the enemies in the land of Canaan to test and to prove every generation of Israelite, did they really... Do, are they really right with God? Do they really believe Him? Do they really trust Him? Or is that just a facade? Is it just something on the face? Uh, something on the exterior? We know that when Jesus, in, in the book of Matthew, if you study the book of Matthew, you'll see that Matthew is that transition gospel from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because after 400 years of God's silence, Jesus shows up, and he's, you read through the book of Matthew and you'll see it, that everything that the Jews' religion was on the exterior, it was on the outside. It was all about making a good religious show to everybody. But there was nothing on the inside. So that's why he mentioned about having the outside of the bowl clean. But I don't eat my cereal on the outside of the bowl, except for that one flake that escapes and it's clinging to the outside, and I'll scoop it up. But other than that, I don't much concern myself if there's something on the outside of my bowl, but if there's something on the inside of it, I want it out. I want it clean. I want it gone. And I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a safe assessment to say that with a lot of people, religion is only an exterior thing. It's on the outside, it looks good, and as long as it looks good, then it's okay. But God gives us 
thorns in our flesh to prove whether or not we really do believe what we say we believe. Because faith without what is dead? Works. I don't believe in a work salvation. I don't think anybody here does. I don't think anybody listening does. But the works are the manifestation of our faith. Noah says that he believes God, but does he really believe God? Well, yeah, because he did what God told him to do. He believed God and believed that he was going to destroy the earth with a flood, and so he built the ark. And so anyway, um, if where can I tell you to go? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, we're already there. Um, let me read that, and then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 2. I look at my notes, and I'm always well-intentioned with my notes. It's just sometimes I never stick with them. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, and reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And that's about the only time I like the phrase, for Christ's sake being said. It's when it's quoted scripture. Can I hear an amen on that one? It, I don't know about you, but it just it gets me to no end when people take my Lord's name in vain. I don't like that. That's supposed to taste like soap where I come from. All right, Ephesians 2. Um, turn there. In fact, you're almost there. Galatians, Ephesians. Um, Verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10 uh, mentions what I'm talking about. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto is one of those words that we don't necessarily use very much anymore but what it basically means is for the purpose of good works. That's why we were created. Um, for most people, which is better to have? A one million dollar vase from the Ming Dynasty or a cheap plastic bowl you got from the Dollar Tree store, but you use it every single day. Okay, The bowl is... Because it has a function, it has a good use, it's, it's worth something, it's valuable to us because, it, because of how we use it, it has utility to it. And that's what he's saying here, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God will work and manifest himself through us in the things that we do. And so the purpose of those thorns is just like the purpose of putting two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And that is to give everybody a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose between the trees. Choose whether you want life or whether you want death. Uh, they brought two men before the Jews. Barabbas, who they pulled up out of prison, and Jesus, who had done nothing wrong, and Pilate gave them a choice. And they said, choose. Pick, pick which one you want. I'll free one, and I'll condemn the other. Pilate really thought. I guess Pilate didn't know the Jews very well. But Pilate really thought, this is a no-brainer. They're going to pick uh, to keep Jesus, and they want me to crucify Barabbas. He went and got the guzziest. He went and got Charles Manson. That's what he did. He got Charlie Manson and said, I'll release him or you can have Jesus, whichever one. And they said, crucify Jesus, give us Charles Manson. It's what they, it's what they chose. Jeffrey Dahmer, pick any, pick it. He could have brought Adolf Hitler. 
up to this deal. I'll release Adolf Hitler to you. And they would have, and they would have said, crucify Jesus, give us Hitler. And uh, so, but the, that's the purpose of it, is to give us a choice. And that choice, I believe, extends through our life. You have a choice. God knows the outcome of that choice. And so to him, it's not really a mystery. But God is using, just like he uses the devil, he used Judas Iscariot, he used the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he uses thorns, he uses those things so that our choice to serve him is very clear. And if it's something worth living for, it is something worth dying for, and we'll fight to keep those things that are precious to us. So, um, turn to Proverbs chapter 24. And you're turning there, and let me uh, read again Proverbs 22, 5. I mentioned this last week, but let me just touch on it again. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. And God defines froward as children in whom is no faith. And once again, there is a difference between church members and people who actually believe. And uh, I'm not, I mean, I just don't go around pushing official, in the books, church membership. Um, if you want to join, join. If not, stay that way. That's fine with me. Uh, because you don't need your name written on our church rolls to go to heaven. Uh, and there are people whose names are written in church roll books that are not going to heaven that think they are because that's where our membership is and we've been tithing there for hundreds of years now or tens of years or whatever. They think because they send their tithes there, they think because they have their membership there, that they're going to heaven because of that, and it's just not true. So God always has a way of proving those who are faithful and those who are not. So, the froward, those in whom is no faith, are always going to have thorns and snares blocking the, the phrase, the way. When I say that phrase, what does that make you think of? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So he is the path. He is the, the way that we go to heaven. No man cometh to the Father but by him. But to the froward, those who don't believe, thorns and snares are blocking the way. And they're not going to make it there. They're not going to do it. Um, Mark chapter 4, what do the thorns have the ability to do? to us concerning our faith. Choking out the word. All right? So, I, and I'm setting all this up because I'm going to teach a little bit of works here. And I just want you to, under, I want everybody to understand because every word I say is recorded, it goes online, and it's under the scrutiny of whoever listens. And there's always somebody who likes to cherry pick something I say to make it sound like I say something that I'm not really saying and never have said and don't even believe. But I'm going to preach a little bit of works today because God has put in, has put in. Now my redneck's coming out. God has, well now I don't even know what I was going to say now. God is putting it. Um, anyway, let's go to the Bible. Proverbs 24. Verse 30, I went by the field of the slothful. How easy is it to tell that somebody's lazy? How easy is it? Go to their house. Go to their house. Go to their bedroom. Okay? Go look inside their car. All right? Just examine their life. Because lazy people, they don't do a whole lot. They don't do much of anything. And um, now I understand, you know, everybody has their days. I have my days where some days I don't want to do anything, but then I don't want to be just sitting there not doing anything. I especially don't want that, but then I don't want to do anything. 
So it's, sometimes it's, it happens to all of us. But anyway, there are some people who just show their life a consistent pattern of absolute laziness. And I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And can you tell the difference between a field that has been worked by the hands of a man and a field that is fallow? Can you tell the difference just by looking at it? Absolutely. When men plant something, they always do it in rows. Always. We plant vineyards in rows. We plant trees in rows. We plant wheat, put it in corn, everything we plant it in rice, soybeans. They're planted in rows. And you can look at a field and see whether or not the hand of man has been applied to it or it's just fallow. In the state of Missouri, we brought this up last week, the state of Missouri, you see cedar trees everywhere. Okay, that is a field that is fallow. It's a, no man has put anything to it, either by death or whatever, or they just decided to repurpose that land, make it a habitat or whatever. But the field, the, the vineyard of the slothful, is always going, you're always going to be able to tell the difference in it. And God makes it an obvious, clear difference. There's just something in our nature that wants, when we plant things, when we do things, we want things in a row. We want things to, to line up. That's how we are. Uh, I had this in my mind last night concerning the message I'm going to preach this morning about reconciling things or justifying things. When things are justified... In printing terms, justification means that both columns, look at your Bible. The words that are in the pages of your Bible are justified on both columns. That means the left and right sides form a straight line up and down the page. We like it that way. We like to see print that way. We like it uniform. We like it justified. We like for the ends to line up together and to be just. But nature doesn't do things that way. Nature doesn't draw straight lines very well. Nature doesn't plant things in rows and neatly, you know, neat, tidy little mounds. It doesn't do that. And so a person's life, nobody wants anybody judging them, but Sometimes things are so obvious, there's no way we can't judge them. Should we judge, well, let me ask it this way. Can we judge someone, or is it obvious whether or not someone bathes themselves on a regular basis? If somebody doesn't clean themselves, isn't that obvious? Nobody likes to be judged, but you stink, okay? You have a stench. It's natural body odor, we get it, but we have remedies. It's called soap, water. It's real easy to come by, okay? Uh, so sometimes things are just that obvious. And I have found that with God, even in things in my mind that are gray areas, they're not gray with God. Gray is a mixture of white and black. And with God, it's all black or white, but not a mixture. And the more that I know God, the more I know the Bible, the more I know about God, all these issues in my mind that at, in time past were gray areas, now they're very clear. And in this case here, the field of the slothful is something that is it's easily recognizable, especially in my own life. I think God is waking me up this year with, with me, dealing with me and issues related to me. And God is sort of making, as far as my judgment of myself is concerned, to me, God's making some things pretty clear to me. I don't like it, but that's what he's doing, and I need it. So, the field of the slothful, the vineyard of a man void of understanding, those two things go together. Lo, what is all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. 
Then I saw and considered it well and looked upon it and received instruction. So if I were to just throw this out to you, to me there's some obvious things here, but what I think is obvious may not be obvious to everybody else. What do you think that this man needs to do concerning his vineyard? What do you think, what's the first thing he needs to do? Huh? Till it. First thing he needs to do. So what did God say? Break up your fallow ground. Your fallow ground is the ground that has gotten hardened because you haven't tilled it. It is hard as a rock, and God has designed that the seed that we need to eat from doesn't do very well unless we work at it. Now thorns and nettles and brambles and briars and beggar lice and everything else out there, it doesn't need poison ivy. I wish poison ivy would go away. I hate poison ivy. I am fiercely allergic to poison ivy. I hate it. It's, it's why I don't, I love to go in the woods and I don't go in the woods except for in the middle of winter because of poison ivy. But I, nobody that I know of grows and cultivates poison ivy. It's just there and it's there in abundance. But I guess everything serves a purpose, right? Maybe God doesn't want me in the woods, that's why. But anyway, the things that we eat, the things that we thrive on, that we absolutely need, those things don't do well unless we put our hand to the till, our, our nose to the grindstone, as it were, unless we're doing something about it. There's a school of thought, I guess I would say, that essentially says, once you pray a sinner's prayer, you are guaranteed eternal life for all of it, for, forever and ever and ever, and you don't have to do a single thing afterward in order to maintain that or keep that, or I guess a better way of saying it is to manifest it. And I know, I have known some people who use that as an excuse to never go to church, give up their sinful habits, read their Bible, or even act in a decent, moral, Christian manner. They use that as an excuse. I was told that I was saved when I was seven years old, and so I don't have to do anything from here on out. To me... Those who are really saved, they don't think that way. Amen. They don't see Christian life. It's those who want to make excuses. They see it that way. But to me, those who are truly faithful and love the Lord, when you love somebody, you do things for them. You cultivate, see I'm using words here, you cultivate a relationship, seeds are sown, things are done to take care of. My wife and I, 32 years this year, but it, it's been work. In many ways, it's been work. She and I have had to cultivate our relationship with each other, and we still need to do that from time to time. We need to work at maintaining our marriage. We need to do that. I need to do that. She needs to do that. And so, again, don't think I'm teaching you you have to work in order to stay saved or be saved or whatever. But from what everything I can see in the Bible, works are part of it. If you, if you show me, James said, you show me a man who says, I have faith and not works. And James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. It's just that simple. So, but the slothful and those who are void of understanding, they see no reason to go out and break up the clods and the fallow ground. They see no reason to do that. I mean, if I'm going to get just as many grapes 
by not doing something as I am by doing something, then why would I do something? That's their reasoning. I'll give it to you like this. There are people, white, black, you name it. The color doesn't matter. But there are people who know that they can get a living from the government without doing anything. They know that. And they have said, well, if I can get free food, free rent, free money from the government for, for not doing something, why then would I go out and do something? You see, the people who are paying their rent and their grocery bills and their, and their living, they don't think that way. I mean, obviously, I don't know how to do it, but obviously you can get on government programs and just live off the government. Apparently you can do that. Why, but why would anybody want to do that? It's like stealing from people, okay? Or the way some people are with crimes. You ask the question, why would somebody do that? We don't normally think that way or necessarily think that way. And so when you see a, a field that is fallow and not tilled up and not producing anything, to those of us who work, those of us who know how things happen, we look at that and say, that needs to be tilled. But the slothful and the lazy and those who, are un who have no understanding don't. And so they think that they're going to get grapes out of thorns. And Jesus said, that doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. So you want grapes? Sow grapes. Plow up the field. Work that field. Tend to it. Take care of it. Uh, so we've got to plow it up. Second, what else has got to happen here? After you've sown the seed, you can just walk off and leave it? Can you do that? No. The reason the thorns and nettles show up there is they're there automatically in the dirt, in the ground. And once you see them there, is it okay to just ignore them? No. The point is this, you have to, you got to bend over and you got to do something about it. You've got to, you've got to tend to that field. Once you plow it up, once you sow the seed, you want to do is, you want those grapes to come up, and we already know, Mark chapter 4, that those thorns, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, are going to choke out what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Take this and apply it. Let's apply it to, um, we can apply it to a marriage or any other kind of relationship, a friendship. Um, if you say that you're friends with somebody, to me, friendship always goes two ways. If, um, if Caleb said that he and, who is uh, LeBron James, okay? He's a basketball player, for those of you who don't know. If Caleb said that he and LeBron James were good friends, I would think that maybe Caleb thinks that LeBron James is a really good friend of his, but friendship always like goes two ways. Am I right? Because while you may be willing to do anything in the world for LeBron James, what does he do for you? He didn't call you, then text you, then invite you to go out, buy you a hamburger. He doesn't do anything to cultivate that relationship. And so there doesn't really then exist a real rational friendship. The same applies in any kind of relationship. When party A or party B, or let's say both parties, 
You can have a marriage and people staying together, but if they don't love each other and care nothing about the relationship, then they're both going to be doing everything in the world to choke that marriage out. And does that happen? Okay, I knew a couple that they were both constantly on their computer at separate ends of the house, hooking up with people outside of the marriage, and this was going on all the time. Well, guess what? They ended up getting a divorce. <laughs> I mean, really? Duh. They did absolutely nothing to cultivate and work out that relationship. Absolutely nothing. So they ended up, it, the thorns choked out that relationship. Why is it that, well, I don't know if I want to say that. I won't. But you get my point. That field is yours. God's given you that vineyard. You own it. It's yours to do with what you please. Okay? Your life. You can live it however you want to live it. And the choice to have eternal life is yours as well. It's yours for the taking. It's absolutely free. And it's yours for the losing. It's, it's your choice. You can do what you want with it. But just know the way of nature, know the way of life goes, that for the things that we want that are most precious to us and most dear to us, those things that we want, it takes our effort. It at least takes our desire. Now, you may have a plow and not have much strength or the knowledge to know what to do with it, but put the thing in your hand and let God push it for you. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at anyway, is that God is the one who wants to work through us and manifest through us. I mean, Gideon's army, he didn't ask them to fight. He just said, go up and hold these pitchers, break them when I say go, blow the trumpet, and say these words, and I'll do the rest. I mean, my goodness, how much easier could God make this thing? Right? I mean, it's not, it's not that, when you think of it, it's not that difficult. Uh, when Joshua and Caleb came back from spying the land, they both tried to present this thing to the Israelites about as easy as you could make it. They came back and said, God, yeah, and we know they're giants, but God has taken out their desire to fight. There's nothing in them. And besides that, God said, we can eat them. They'll, they'll be food for us. They tried to present this to the Israelites as being the easiest thing in the world. All we got to do is get up and walk in that direction. And God would fight the battles and God would do this thing for us. And they still, they didn't want, and I, I listen, we all know that there's people out there that say, oh, I don't work because I can't find a job. You can give them a job and they won't work it. Am I right? You give them a job, give them, put the tools in their hand, right? But they won't do it. Why? Lazy, slothful, void of understanding. They don't see the world the way everybody else sees the world. And so, so we got the, the, the field plowed up. We understand that when we see the thorns, or let me say it like this, when those thorns in your life begin to manifest themselves, and they will, and you know it when they do, correct? Well, you know it. You deal with it. Deal with it right then. Deal with it later. But deal with it. Okay? Bend over. Pull, pull one of them stupid things up. And we all know that the more often you do it, the easier it is. Do it less often. I mean, pulling up weeds out of your flower garden or your garden or whatever, do it less often, you're going to have more work. Do it, do it more often, it's going to be easier. It's going to be a job done that's relatively simple, and then you can go on to other things. 
So we all know that. But then he mentions the wall. The stone wall broken down. Walls are pictures of salvation. To me, that's very clear in the Bible. How long is Trump going to hold the government shut down? He's determined to get this wall built. You know what? He's not wrong. Walls are the salvation. And if you don't believe that, Nancy Pelosi, then open the gate to your multi-million dollar mansion and let us all walk through your house. Amen. These people are such hypocrites. They are hypocrites. Okay? Joe Kennedy gets elected. Trump builds a wall, I'm going to tear it down. Start with the one that confines the Kennedy compound. You people have lived sheltered lives for the last hundred years in this country, making money off booze, all right? So don't tell me about how liberal you are and how you think it's okay that everybody just walks in because you don't really believe that. But they're a bunch of hypocrites. But anyway, walls are salvation. Walls are intended to keep things in that should stay in. Walls are, walls are good for sheep. Because sheep like to do one thing, go astray. That's what us sheep love to do. We love to go astray. And if it was not for the walls and the boundaries that God places around our lives, we'd be gone. And there's, there's, there's no way around this, people. And there's not one of you that's above that. We all need the walls. We all need the rules. We all, do you think Congress needs the same rules everybody else has to live by? Absolutely. Absolutely. Huh? Same health care. Same health care, same rules, same laws, same everything. Because if they're to represent the people, they should be of the people. Okay? And um, so anyway, where was I? Boy, I'd lost my thought. But anyway... Walls of salvation, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I lost every, lost every thought I had, okay? But those walls are necessary. And what happens when we see a breach in the wall? If you cut yourself and you're bleeding, you do something about it. Your body automatically starts doing something about it, but we have bandages, band-aids, gauze, whatever, to stop that bleeding. That skin is a wall. Every cell in my body has a cell wall, a membrane around it, holding things in that need to stay in. That's where I was going, sheep. Okay, we will easily go astray without the rules and the guidelines. Without my skin holding all this beauty in. Why do you laugh the loudest of anybody in this whole room, Chris? Okay? Without skin holding all this in, it would just all come out. But skin also keeps those things out that I need to stay out. Places that we cannot go people that we should not be around, uh, things that we should not look at, things that we should not listen to, things that we should not, uh, just things in general that we need to be separate from. The first thing the Israelites did when they came back from 70 years of Babylonian captivity, start building that wall again. Binding up the breaches of the wound that had happened to Jerusalem because the walls were intended to keep the bad things out and thus defend us, stand up for us, to protect us. Paul mentions in Ephesians 6, putting on the whole armor of God. You know what that is? It's a wall. Your helmet, your shield, your loins, girdle, your shoes, Every part of that was a wall that's designed to protect and keep the fiery darts of the enemy out. 
And all of this, all of this is right in your Bible. Um, if you want something to study this week, study the plow. Study the plow in the Bible and what it's for. Um, break, not only breaking up that ground in that aspect, but also a, a, a mini plow that we hold in our hand is a hoe. And we use that to keep the ground broken up, but also to keep up those little thorns. When those little seedlings come up, and we know that we didn't plant those there, that's your first sign that something's going on, something's manifesting itself. And the purpose of a handheld plow, a hoe, is to break that up and to get that out of, out of your garden. Mulch it up if you want to, or just throw it out or get rid of it, whatever. But that's the purpose of it. So study, study plows in the Bible. There's a lot of good things in here that I was going to get to today, but the bell rang, so... Pray for me today, I'll pray for you, all right? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon this Sunday school time, upon this lesson. Father, we need the work. You've designed it, God, so that we're in the days of labor right now. We're in the time of work. The time for rest has not come yet. But Lord, there's a lot of work that we ourselves need to do in our lives. And Father, I believe you're making me aware of things that need to be done in my life, things that need to be done with me. And Father, in some cases, I don't even know exactly what they are, but I know you do, and I trust you. So Father, I make this my prayer, and I make it publicly. God, would you help me? Show me, Lord, the areas of life that you want to work on. Show me, Father, what it's going to take for you to do that work. And Lord, give me a willing heart to be willing for you to move me in a much greater way. And Father, do it for my wife's sake. Do it for my family's sake. Do it for all my children, all my children. Friends, do it for this church. Do it for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Whatever you do in my life, let it be for the benefit and the blessing of others and your kingdom first. Thank you, God, Lord, for teaching us in good things today. We needed it. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.